This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Welcome, listeners, to a new show of uh, Software Engineering Radio. Uh, my name is Johannes, and today... I want to talk with uh, three gentlemen on the other side of the Skype connection um, about their book they wrote 20 years ago, which was uh, the book Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. And um, with me are actually Eric Gamma, uh, Richard Helm and Ralph Johnson. Welcome to the show, you three. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so let's first look a little bit about what um, those people did. Um, so Erich Gamma is, of course, author of the Design Pattern book and uh, therefore member of the so-called Gang of Four. Um, he holds a PhD from the University of Zurich and this um, his degree was actually the, the foundation for um, the Design Pattern book. Um, later on, uh, I heard he created JUnit together with Kent Beck, drinking Alm Doodler on Austrian Airlines. Flying um, the conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, also... Uh, later on, he became a distinguished engineer with uh, Rational Software, uh, later IBM Rational, where he uh, introduced the Java IDE and uh, worked on a collab collaboration tool called Jazz. And uh, since 2011, he is distinguished engineer at Microsoft, where he works uh, on Visual Studio. So uh, welcome back to the show. You have already been here in 2007 for show 81, Eric. And I was talking about pattern. Uh, you talked about everything, <laughs> about your life up until that point. Okay. Then let's try to talk about something different today. <laughs> um, so next on uh, on the list of, of the four authors is uh, Richard Helm, um, also author of the book. Um, he holds a PhD from uh, in informatics from the University of Melbourne. He has been uh, involved uh, in Uppsala Conference as a committee member, uh, worked for IBM Research, and was part of the team which worked on IBM Watson. Um, oh, not and... really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> What have you been doing? Well, much, uh, we worked on patterns and we worked on um, kind of software technology. Watson was a, it was at Watson Research Labs, but Watson was much, much later. Ah, okay. So I, I misunderstood the uh, Wikipedia article. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember he worked on contracts, protocols, kind of, yeah, was really being in the space. Remember, Richard? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> so, uh, and, and later on, he became a consultant for the DM Group and IBM P Consulting. And uh, then actually he left the, the computer industry. And today he is a partner and managing director at Boston Consulting Group. And um, he also, according to the website of Boston Consulting, is a, is a fellow there where he works on technology-enabled transformation of companies and in industries. Uh, yeah, welcome to the show, show Richard. It's very nice to have you here. Um, lastly, we have uh, Ralph Johnson, um, and he's also author of the Design Pattern book. Uh, and he is today a research associate at uh, the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, his Wikipedia article states he's a pioneer of the Smalltalk language, so he is the person who contributed all the Smalltalk examples to the Design Pattern book. Um, he served at uh, several executive roles at Uppsala Conference and currently works um, on a financial accounting system in Gro Groovy at Metafficient. Um, also, welcome to the show, Ralph. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, as I already said, there was this, the the authors of this book have been called the Gang of Four, um, but we are only three. Um, there's a fourth person called John. Richard, can you tell us what happened to him? So, John was a um, a loved colleague of ours. Um, he worked with me at um, IBM Watson um, when we first started the book, and I re remember many times every morning walking down um, the corridor to um, shoot the breeze about um, whatever was on our minds that day. And um, he worked very closely with all of us as we put the book together. And um, very sadly and tragically, he 
um, passed away in um, 2005 of a, um, a brain tumour. And um, we we miss him dearly. Um, and his spirit is in the book everywhere. He did a lot of work to um, push us to finish it on time um, and worked very, very closely with the publishers, Addison Wesley, to do it. But there is lots of John, um, as all of us, in the book. And um, I certainly think of him often as um, – um, we come across the um, examples of patterns, and even in the work that I do nowadays, and um, a lot of the fact that the book got out is testament to John's hard perspiration, if you like, um, after the, our collective inspiration in the last few months in um, before we released it to get it through the quite complex and always challenging process to um, get it pre published and printed. He actually did the the memory, right, is still with us. You open the book, you read one page, and you see kind of, I see John. So that's really good, right? Even though he passed away, he's deep in our memory. And he really was the master wordsmith and passionately till the very end, right, squeezed the best words of, of our initial word to make it better. So that's why he's so fond in my memory, right? If I open one page and I, I read John, even though it's a joint contribution, right? John put lots of his style in it, which was great. Yes, he, he definitely put a lot of his style in it. So he, he is kind of with us in spirit today as well. Yes, yes. Good. Um, maybe maybe some, some detail about how we record this episode before we go into the, the start. So um, Erich is actually sitting in Zurich. I'm sitting in, in Hamburg, so we are on the same time zone. But Richard is in Sydney um, a couple of hours before us, so right in the morning. Uh, Ralph is uh, in Illinois, which is a couple of hours behind us. So he's in the afternoon. Uh, we are in the evening, and, and Richard is in the morning. So uh, very different uh, perspective, but still, uh, I hope it's going to be an interesting episode. And I would like to start with like the very fundamental questions. The question uh, is, what is a design pattern at all? But when I describe it to people who aren't computer people, I usually say that it's a catalog of design techniques. My brother is a, a woodworker. He uh, builds cabinets and tables and things like that. And he's got a bunch of books, which he bought from somebody else, of course, uh, that describe different woodworking techniques. And every and the books are divided up into chapters, and each one has a few pages that will usually show a picture of the finished uh, article, you know, so, so there's like a dovetail corner. So they'll show some some article that has that in it, but then it shows how you make it and how you hold your hands while you're cutting the wood. And it teaches you how to do that particular technique. And one of the things that we talked about as we were writing the book was that there's a lot of techniques. You have algorithms, data structures that people write books about. But there's a lot of design information and software that just was never documented, was never cataloged. And so uh, Eric came to me and said, do you want to help us with this book. And I said, well, I've never worked on a catalog before. It, I think it would be an interesting project. So that was really what we were trying to do was to help catalog these design techniques. And we were focusing on object-oriented design techniques. And it was at the time when object-oriented programming was just beginning to be popular. And so a lot of people wanted to learn object-oriented programming. They were looking for, uh, for, for uh, design information like this. And so it was a, a good time for the book. Can you make an example maybe of one of the design patterns from the book so people can relate to it a little bit? We could each give our favorite one. Well, strategy is very popular, right? So you want to vary uh, some particular behavior in your system. So rather than just bake it into your object, you kind of come up with a structure. And we describe in a pattern how to make some behavior pluggable. And we have a format in for doing that. And we describe you variations for doing that. and Strategy is about really delegating some behavior to a separate object so that you can then plug in a different object and change the behavior dynamically in a flexible way. So it's really about partitioning behavior using polymorphism in a way that improves your design. I think Ralph mentioned it's about object and techniques. I think it's about nice uses of object and techniques. I would almost say it has to be cool, otherwise it's not a pattern, right? So we don't describe how to add an element to a linked list, but we describe how to use polymorphism to get pluggable behavior, how to reduce interface to decouple uh, objects, things like that. So my favorite pattern is a composite. And the composite pattern is about uh, making it so that you can treat a group of objects at this as if they're a single object. 
And you need to have an interface to find an interface that could either be the interface of a single object or an interface of a group of objects. And then you'll have uh, some classes or maybe just a class, which is this composite class, which is able to uh, have a list or, or you know, keeps a, a group of objects in, in, in some way. Often there'll be a number of different kinds of composite classes, uh, but they all, all those classes. So you think, of course, you have classes that represent just a single object. Uh, they're your, <coughs> your base. And it's that whole collection that's having the interface, the common interface, then having these composite classes and having non-composite classes all together that make up the composite pattern. And you see that in a user interface when you have a window and the window will have various parts, but you can grab the window and move the whole window and all the parts of the window move at the same time. And you're, you're thinking that just a single object that you're manipulating, but it really is a bunch of them. And there's a lot of cases in programs where you want to do something like that. Hey, Richard, now please don't pick Singleton as your favorite. Right? <laughs> I was just about to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which probably speaks to, which we can talk about later, about some of the patterns which should be voted out of the book. Um, I think for me, um, I always liked um, um, Ob Observer because um, I think, and I've, for me, and that's well before we started the book, it was really the, how to think about the role of composition in building systems um, as a um, and that's about how you dynamically construct the if you like the runtime architecture of systems and make the various parts um, communicate with one another um, versus what is often the static structure that appears in other languages in in the software and for me that was the where I finally I think um, got what um, a lot about object oriented programming at the time and how to think differently about systems from a runtime perspective rather than a purely static code perspective. And that's where you see some of the aphorisms in the book about book about failing, um, favoring, I think such as um, composition over inheritance and this notion of kind of separating out the concept that varies. I think to me that's before the book, but I still like it um, where I think the, one of the big revelations occurred. And Observer is interesting because it's one of those patterns which is, was in the small talk, right? And yeah. in a very simple form, but it has evolved quite a bit, right? Then with Java listeners, how to use interface to delegate yep. it. <clears throat> then um, later on, no data binding, how you bind widgets to data, and then it synchronizes using Observer. And today, you know, reactive programming, how you can make it easier to deal with all these events that come along. So it's a very rich one. And also you see it in when in my work today and that's kind of in within the code but also um in dealing with the companies i deal with nowadays in large enterprises how you connect kind of large enterprise systems across a, a large corporate technology landscape make various parts together and you see variations of that in the large as opposed in the system level as opposed to within a, a code level mm. um can i just also make one other observation and i i actually used when People talk to me about, um, ask me about design patterns. I use exactly the same um, example that Ralph does about kind of woodworking. But actually, the history of patterns goes um, back way further than that. Um, I stumbled in Sydney, for many of our listeners may have been to Sydney, there is a, a, um, a sort of sculpture overlooking the Sydney Opera House, um, which is in recognition of um, – the first governor of Australia in 1810 to 1821. Um, he was governing the colony of Australia and his wife arrived with a book of patterns about how to um, build certain types of neoclassical buildings. And I saw the sculpture and went to the um, the Museum of Australia, actually, and, and asked the person who was in charge of um, and antique books if it was possible to have a look at the, a copy of this patent book, did they have one? And they brought one out with white cotton gloves and laid it out <laughs> on a, a special um, table on a pillow just to protect the um, the pages of the book. And in there, there was it was a book of patterns of buildings, and um, and those buildings were um, told particular design um, problems of um, size, number of families, purpose of um, buildings. Highly um, unsuitable for Australia, I have to add, um, because they were brought from England and the climate here and the temperature is somewhat different. But if you even today walk around Sydney, you can see examples of buildings which reflected that original pattern book from 1810. Can you, when, um, can you kind of when imagine? 
can you imagine that someone will look at your book uh, in the future somewhere like that? Well, I'm already very proud. It's 20 years old and still in print, right? <laughs> so <laughs> let's let's celebrate that for now. I, I have a copy yeah. here. It's only five years old. <laughs> Um, Have you read it? Uh, I, I actually did, yeah. I, even in preparation to this episode, I read it cover to cover uh, for the first time. Um, I think I think it, it would be love. To be, it's, it is quite um, humbling and um, to see that it uh, it's it's still in print and and people actually uh, still buy it. Um, I think, like all these sorts of books, and there's examples of pattern books and engineering as well, which was um, uh, I've. I've seen and discovered since I think all the, 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 the patterns in the book are somewhat universal because we, you see them evolve over time as the technology has changed in um, software engineering and software technology. And you see different variations of languages and ways to solve design problems. And Eric just talked about some of them, um, but technology does, does evolve and there are different people no doubt find um, different ways of solving design problems and what thought people thought was a terrific idea at the time um people sort of work out later on that perhaps it wasn't a great idea and or there are better alternatives and hence the laughter earlier on about singleton <laughs> yeah. um maybe maybe take a, a step back before we go into how, how it developed um I'm 30 years old, so I was 10 when the book came out, and I didn't read it on the first day. <laughs> um, so what was the industry looking when you were actually working on the book, and uh, what triggered you to write the book? <laughs> so the industry, right? It was, I think there was the Oopsla conference was the coolest thing on earth, right? You go there, and uh, it was really, it was a very cool conference. And at the same time, there was a whole movement on methodologies, how you design object-oriented systems. So, so uh, design methodology is not agile or process Design methodology, methodology yeah. is not about development process. So I write the books about object-oriented design and so on. It was a lot about modeling, right? About how you uh, diagram these structures, how we represent the models. And at least to me, you know, I, I read lots of code at that time, working on my thesis, right? Reading small doc, re writing our own code, reading interviews that John worked on or... or I draw, and it just kind of missed the coolness I saw in small talk in the libraries in code we wrote where how we use objects in this it wasn't captured in the methodologies, right? I think they just talked about not the stuff how I think you can use object techniques as as a developer, so that's why i i I found these deeper, more interesting structures and uh, what happened then I met Richard for the first time and it looked like we had the same feeling right there is something here which goes deeper than just the uh, class hierarchies and coming up with some uh, representation of uh, persons and or accounts, whatever, right? So that was kind of my thing. It was a lot of focus on um, design methodologies, which were a little bit abstract, and <clears throat> they didn't capture kind of, for me, some of the essence of objects, polymorphism, and what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you you said you uh, first you, Richard, and Erich wor uh, worked together on it. How came the other two on board? So, I, I, yeah, I think it's, I remember um, Eric and I sitting in in Zurich actually on with his on a hot summer time talking Sipping about liters of iced tea. Right, the creation myth is <laughs> iced tea drinking. <laughs> Can you please elaborate on the creation myth? <laughs> All the interesting things have some creation myth, right? So, and our creation is we drank lots of iced tea. I guess yeah, uh, and various beers, I recall too. <laughs> <laughs> after, yeah, after the work. After, um, yeah, I think so. I think that's where. Um, Eric and I spoke a lot about exactly the point he made. Like actually, when because I was um, working with interviews at the time, um, which is John's, which came out of John's PhD thesis, um, which was a, uh, a a class library and frameworks um, for um, user interfaces, graphical editors, um, this um, framework called UniDraw at the time. And and what struck me um, was two things. One was that, that John wrote fantastically fantastic code. Um, it was really elegant and simple to understand and read. But in that, um, in the software there, there was um, some terrific design ideas. And that's where, and so I was looking at that and thinking, well, it's exactly as Eric said, that you read the methods and nobody's talking about this stuff. And so Eric and I spoke a lot about this off the back of um, 
a trip that I happened to be in Zurich for, and there was kind of a meeting of minds there. And then at that time, soon or soon after, John uh, came to work with us at IBM Watson Labs um, in outside New York. And that, that meant for me was actually there was another kind of like-minded soul um, nearby who we could talk about these ideas. And then um, there was – and the sequence in, is not going to be perfect here. There was a series of um, workshops held at Upslo in the early 90s, which a guy called Bruce Anderson put together, which was titled um, Towards an Architecture – a Software Architecture Handbook, where there were other people were starting to get glimpses of different ways of thinking about – rather than a, methodologi a methodological approach to software, is a alternative ways to kind of capture what people know how to do things. And so we participated in that and actually got to know Ralph um, through that process. And then sort of I think that there was a – then there was a kind of recognition that was, and certainly that Ralph expertise and experience in small talk at that um, time, he was like um, very well – respected and recognized and had kind of clearly a deep expertise at that time, I'm um, still does, about um, the small talk world. Actually, that was another source of engineering ideas or design ideas that we thought would be really helpful to um, bring into the idea of this um, book or handbook. Um, and in those days, we wrote, there's a, we, and all of us, I think, still have a copy of it somewhere in the in our filing cabinets, a 20-page version of the book, which had 20 patterns in it, one per page, which we put together as part of those workshops. And I think that was really the germ of the idea for a potentially this could be a book. And it sort of grew from that. So um, you, you first created a few workshops on, on the book or, uh, before you like, started to write the Actually, book. The, the workshops are independent. Right? We just met there, I would say. Yeah, yeah, the workshops were Bruce Anderson's idea. He was pushing them, and it had, they were definitely not pattern workshops. It was what kind of literature does a software architect need? It was a much bigger goal than that. And there, there were two workshops in particular because the first one, I had met Eric a little bit before. I had never met Richard. Uh, I think I had been in the same room with John, but had never talked with him before. So at this, um, we, we all were supposed to write uh, what we thought ought to be in the architecture handbook and to write a, like a sample chapter of what we thought should be in the architecture handbook. And I remember that I was thinking frameworks. The frameworks were an important thing that ought to be in this kind of handbook. And so I wrote something about that. But I remember that, uh, that Eric and Richard had a joint presentation. And when they got up and they went through these different patterns, I recognized that all the patterns they were teaching or that all the patterns they had were things I was teaching in my object oriented design course. I either gave them a different name or I didn't even have a name. I often would teach them by example, but I knew you know, right away, yeah, these are the examples. This is where I'm trying to teach. And so I came out of that workshop thinking still that, that framework <clears throat> were an important thing that ought to be in the architect's handbook, but that these design patterns was a whole important level of design information that I hadn't been thinking about, that, but that. Uh, ought to be there. So I recognized them. It wasn't like I, I didn't, I knew them already, but I hadn't, didn't realize that I knew them before. The other interesting thing that happened was I had been visiting Tektronics for a number of years and knew Kent from there. And I was using one of his, uh, I was using HotDraw, which was one of the frameworks he had developed. Mm -hmm. And Kent is Kent Beck in this case. Yeah, Kent Beck and, yeah. and Ward Cunningham. Uh, that was a, a project of theirs. So uh, I, I believe both of them were at the, uh, but we were supposed to, at this workshop, we were supposed to uh, work in small groups and make some sort of a poster that we present to everybody else. And Kent said to me, uh, I want to write a pattern language for Hot Draw. And I know you've been using Hot Draw, and I know that you've read Christopher Alexander's books. And that's because he was twisting my arm to make me read the books. Over Whenever I would see him, he would, he would, he would tell me I, I should read them. And so let's write one. And I was... I, I, I'm I'm always willing to try anything, okay? So I I, I won't say I was I was skeptical. I, I was definitely not a believer. But we sat down and we spent a couple of hours and we wrote all these. And he said for our demonstration we should teach them to somebody else. So we grabbed Norm Kerf and we explained these patterns. There were like ten of them to him. And then when it came time to do a demo of our or do a presentation on our poster, what we did was um, 
we said to the audience, describe a graphical program, some sort of a graphical editor you would like to see built. And, and someone said, how about this? And so we said, we have written a pattern language and we have taught it to Norm Kurth, and he is now going to design it for you. And so he showed how you'd use the, the pattern language to design a, a – I don't know how much he knew about hot draw already. Maybe he knew more. But it was a, a great success, and I was so impressed by that whole experience that you know, breaking something down into patterns really, really can work. And that started me uh, using patterns in, in my own teaching. Uh, and it, was, it really was a year later that the next workshop was when they invited me to, uh, to join in with them. And, and John, by that time, John was working with them, and I was the fourth one to join the project. And interestingly, John's PhD thesis was also about the drawing framework uh, Unidraw, which had also similar concepts like hot drawing there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe a note for the listeners: I'm like not this time. I'm not jumping in on any term um, regarding patterns because we kind of assume you know a lot about pattern what is a pattern language uh, if you don't we have older episodes on design patterns um, and i'm going to link them in the show notes uh, but i want to focus in this episode more about like the history uh, how it came to them and how they evol evolved over time um one thing i'm particularly interesting uh, interested about because it's it's nowhere documented is so we know kind of how you found each other and it was uh, based on ISTS as i know now but Uh, how did this name Gang of Four came into place? Not really sure. I, mean, I don't know who did it first, but you, it, it's helpful to have a name for a group and somebody came up with that name. Was it Brian Foote that came it up with been, It might have been Brian Foote. It's the exact sort of name that Brian Foote would, would come up with. But I'm not sure whether he actually invented it or, or, or first applied it to this or not. But anyway, you know, it was the, the, the Chinese gang of four was in the news. And so it was the sort of name that would stick. Yeah. And I liked it because uh, it, it was also the name of an English post-punk band from Leeds that I really <laughs> liked a lot at that time. So it was good, good move. <laughs> but you didn't, you didn't do any... <laughs> You didn't do anything like behaving specifically, specifically like a gang that people started calling you that way. No, we didn't walk through the Oopsla conference with chains and in black letter suits. No, that wasn't us. No. Oh, okay. If you saw four guys, it wasn't us. No. <laughs> um, did you, when you were writing, so you 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 had this early idea and then at some point you decided to turn it into into a book. Uh, how did that come about? That was a very important intermediate step, right? We said, okay, we have all these ideas. You want to do something? So I guess the first milestone was we did a paper for the European Conference on Opportunity Programming. By the time we had that paper, we had written like 70 pages. So we knew it was going to be a book because there was nothing else you could do with 70 pages. We had to extract stuff to make paper. But when we started, we weren't necessarily thinking a book. Uh, it, it, but by the time we hit <clears throat> 70 pages, it was obvious that was where it was going. Yeah, and I think the process from, from there was that um, – so I was living in New York at the time, and there was a um, – a, A conference running in New York, um, I think it might have been something called Object World at the time, and I went went to that and spoke to John Waite at um, the hotel where the conference was um, running. And um, I think I handed him a draft of the, the 70 odd pages and said, look, we're thinking about this, writing this book. Um, what do you think? Here's what it's roughly about, the idea, it's some kind of handbook of software engineering or object-oriented design. And, um, And then John took that way, did a bit of diligence and spoke to a few people in the industry who he knew. And then um, shortly thereafter, um, we um, met with them again, met with Addison Wettersley again, and then we signed the, uh, the contract for the book. And then um, the wheels were set in motion. And then from then on, though, we were never, we have only met once in person and we wrote it all by email. I guess 3,000 emails happened on the way to the book then. 3,000 emails. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was exactly. We were, we were in however many different countries. I was in Canada. Ralph was in the US. Um, I was in the US at, working for Apple Intelligent. Yeah, and, but we never physically got together. We did it all electronically and 
sent chapters of the book or patterns to each other and sort of had a, a weekly um, development and release cycle, if you like, um, where we um, slowly but surely added each of our thoughts, ideas to each section, um, made sure that, because well, all of us had clearly different ideas and inputs and um, slowly but surely developed the um, the book over the next year or so, I, th I think, um, to have it eventually be put into production in sort of actually about this time. So it's August now in 1994 for actually being printed to be delivered at the Uppsala conference. Wasn't this this time when John told us, he told us the deadline is kind of August? That's yeah, right. That's right. But like June was the original deadline. June, or, yeah, okay. and, and the beginning of July. So we had like another month after we thought the first deadline, we then had another month or so before the real deadline. And partly the reason, I mean, nowadays they've even shortened those deadlines. But back then it was a very short deadline because we were giving them postscript. This is before PDF, so it was postscript. And John produced all the postscript and was he was obsessing over every pixel. And so they didn't have to change anything that he gave them. I've used LaTeX, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What's interesting, though, it was a lot of evolution kind of insight. So we, we had fights about how things should go, right? It was because you worked different libraries. Now, I worked ET with Andre Weinand from Switzerland. John was interviews with Richard and others, no Stanford, whatever. And it took us a while to understand there is no right or wrong way, right? So we could argue, you know, that's how you really should do it. And John was really quoting interviews and I was quoting other things and Ralph the small way and Richard, whatever. And it took us a while to understand there's no right or wrong. There's kind of variations and trade offs, right? And I think was a, it helped us to get to peace again when you realize that there's not right or wrong, right? It's not, patterns are not prescriptive. Patterns are about trade-offs you make. And that for me was a deep insight. So the, there is um, no only right way uh, a pattern can be implemented. There are many variations, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the richness of patterns, what I like today, right? And I also look at the history, how they evolve, how observer evolve, all the variations, right? That's what's, I'm still, I still like patterns, even after 20 years, right? I still see them everywhere and yeah, I still like them. Was it at that time that you, you had an idea about the impact of the book? So did you want to start a movement or was it just that you <laughs> thought we are four guys and we want to share this and we probably no one is going to read it? We see one thing was interesting. So uh, we were really actually scared what we have, right? So and uh, Richard did wasn't shy at all. He gave it to whoever wanted it, right? I guess on the street you were handing it out, Richard, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we we were scared, and then I don't know. You you gave it to everybody who has a name in the in in Option the Circle, right? And got feedback, and we were already happy. Imagine this something that people want to read. That's kind of, we, we were really happy that the Eco paper got accepted at Eco, which is a scientific conference, right? So. Did this yeah, we, didn't, we didn't have any idea what the nah. impact was going to be when we started it. And it wasn't like it was all carefully planned and so that it would you know, be selling for 20 years. I mean, we, it was just not. But we, in retrospect, we did a lot of things right. One of them was getting a lot of people to read it. We had, uh, I set up an FTP server. This is before the World Wide Web. Okay, So we had FTP server and a mail server and people could join. And we had like 500 people on our mailing list. And And when you read the, the first page, there's an acknowledgement, the long list of people who made comments. A lot of those people were people on the mailing list who would uh, would make comments. And so every every two weeks, I think, we'd put two patterns out, and then we would debate them for a week or two. So this was it was by this time it was fairly mature, but we got a lot of feedback from people, found a lot of things wrong that we wouldn't have found otherwise. So we were pretty serious about trying to make it good. We weren't trying to make it good so we could sell a lot. We were just trying to figure out what was right. I mean, that was, well, a lot of the fun was of writing the book was these arguments that Eric talked about because we got to learn from it. It wasn't just, we're going to explain to everybody what we know. It was, we're trying to understand why do we see these patterns everywhere? What is it about them? And what's the best way to do it? We were, even though there isn't a best way, we were trying to figure out what the best way was. And so, so we weren't, We didn't, these weren't things we invented ourselves. So it wasn't like we had a particular ax to grind. We didn't want to force everybody to think our way. We really were trying to figure it out. And that made a lot of fun. And that's what helped make it be good in the long run. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's make the two final months. Um, so 
uh, the book came out at Uppsala, and apparently there was a, a long queue for uh, getting the book signed. Uh, Linda Rising talks in one of the previous episodes of this book. They're queuing there and really eager to getting the, the four signatures on it. <laughs> How did the it... rock star feeling. We, we described it as the rock star feeling. Of, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you describe a little bit the rock star feeling you had at this moment? Well, because first of all, it was a very tight thing because it was a rush at the end to get the, um, the book to be at Uppsala for the opening of the exhibition. And so we were quite nervous and the publisher was certainly quite nervous. And the books um, that got there um, literally were hot off the press. And and so the conference opened and and they opened the doors. And there was a um, – John White, the, our editor, um, said that he thought there was a fire alarm. There was such a rush of people to the stand. <laughs> hey, didn't um, he give a tutorial at this Uppsala? No, we may have done. Yeah, I can't remember. We could have. Yes, we probably. Because I and think then, that, Ralph, you know. Well, I was. Uh, well, on that particular day, the, you three started signing before me, <laughs> and and so maybe like it opened at ten, and you were there, and I had a tutorial to teach, and I couldn't be there till twelve. It was something like that. By the time I got there, every book was sold, and they were mostly signed and you had a whole bunch of people trying to get their fourth signature uh, <laughs> because I hadn't been there, but uh, they had all been sold by the time by noon. Isn't yeah, the story the, that as in Wesley redirected a truck to, yes, that's right. <laughs> you know, it. I, 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 it's a rumor I have, right? That's, what that's right. They redirected a truck and the, the local bookseller who was actually had the stand um, was trying to get as many copies of the, the book. It was a local Portland bookseller, which actually, ran the stand so it was the sales were um, essentially for that bookshop and they were trying to get copies from all over the u.s to um kind of fulfill the demand because remember upsilon in those days there was a thousand people there it was that big a conference and um the point about being hot off the press as i also remember was that um if you were lucky enough to get a book on the first day um you will notice that all the covers um have would have warped slightly because uh, when printing the books, you have to set, let them sit and be pressed in, in stacks so that the glue hardens properly and they settle down properly. You have to leave them for at least a day or two so they if you like, mature after being bound and glued together. And the books were almost still warm. And so the first set of books sold that week, um, all the covers warped. So they, and they have, so if you're lucky, you have four, um, four signatures and a warped cover. Um, so one of the things you had said was, um, about starting a movement. And we really didn't have any plans for that. We were just trying to write a book. We weren't necessarily looking for bigger ideas beyond this book. There were people who were, in particular Kent Beck, had been interested in Christopher Alexander for a long time and interested in patterns in a, in a bigger uh, scheme. And so he, um, one of the things, he, he had run a workshop uh, a previous year I'm not sure where that, when that was exactly. It was in the summer. It was in Colorado in the Rockies. But he had gotten a number of people, in particular Grady Booch, uh, at this place and, and trying to convince them of the importance of, of patterns. And, and some of the people who came were already pretty interested. Uh, I think I was the only one of us, of the four of us, who was at this. But uh, one of the things that he that Kent succeeded was in convincing Grady Booch that patterns were a great idea. And since our book was the and Grady decided that the next year he was going to, uh, to promote the idea. And since our book was the only one on the horizon, I had come to this with a draft that I could share to people. Because like they had said earlier, we were sharing drafts with anybody we could. Um, he, he basically uh, advertised our book for the next year, for the, for the year before it came out. And there were other people who had seen drafts, who got enthusiastic about it. And so you had a lot of people who were talking about the book. And that really made it, um, made it take off. And it's really been other people. I've been involved in, in organizing conferences on patterns, and I've been you know, happy to push patterns in a bigger – my interest in that really happened more after the book rather than before the book. Hmm. So you, you used a technique today you would call viral marketing. Uh, yes. We, we, we had viral marketing uh, sort of by accident. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about what – like how this movement started after this this book was there. What changed in the industry because of the book? One of my complaints about 
the, the computer science academic community, just in general, was, was that there's a lot of important design information that never got written down. And there wasn't a good place, by a place, I mean, there weren't conferences, there weren't journals, there, there weren't places that, that wanted that kind of information. So a lot of stuff uh, fell through the, the cracks. And, and I think that, that the patterns, having these, these, there's a number of books that have been uh, sold well. Ours isn't the only one, but ours is, is the most prominent of them. But this is given a place, and that's one way where, where people write about more concrete design information. Uh, but at, there's the um, QCon, uh, I guess that's a, the website, right? There's these conferences and they have, uh, they have um, like architectures you, you've always wanted to know about. They have people from different companies talking about the architecture of their software. So there'll be somebody from Facebook or you know, some, some, some place you've, you've heard of talking about the architecture of their system. And I don't know whether that really is you know, influenced by patterns, but that's the kind of concrete information that just that 20 years ago never got out. And now it's very sought after and, and companies are happy to let their people talk about it. And, and certainly programmers love to hear about that. Actually, Richard produced one of this, time, this book timeline slide where he added all <laughs> pattern books in miniature form, copied whatever the book cover, over from from the 80s, you no know, Christopher Alexander, Copeland, whatever, Ecope, then our book, and then all the others. It was amazing. You see a funnel, right, going opens up at, uh, at uh, what was it, in the 90s or 90s? Yeah. For all kind of all the books, you no, know, and system design, software architecture, analysis, uh, development processes. And unfortunately, Richard, I saw, I, I, I was looking at the slide recently, but you stopped at 2004. So you should That's really right. <laughs> I think people have started think, to reflect think, more, right? That's, and, yeah. and use this, this forum. Yeah, it, is more, think, it's also things like the whole open source movement has meant that if you want to get people to use your software, if you want to grow your community, you have to explain it. You have to uh, talk about it. And so you get all you know, conferences where people come up and explain what the key ideas are in their software which they needed to do that in order to attract users. Back in the old days when all software was commercial software, you didn't have to, to talk about the internals as much. You bought it first. And once you, you had bought it, then you could take courses from the vendor on, on the internals. But now things are just much more open and talked about a lot. Yeah. But it's not just patterns. Patterns are part of that whole process. Yeah. It's not the only thing. I think Ralph makes a really, really important point there. Um, we, way back then, um, and I think with Brian Foote, who in his classic way talked about um, software archaeology um, when we were at the period in the early 90s. I think that for people who are starting out, um, you use great software, um, but it's very, very hard to actually understand what makes it great. Um, you can look at, if you're lucky, you get access to the source code. Um, but actually, on the whole, um, the engineering, if you like, at the, the core of many great pieces of software. I recall we used to use Emacs a lot, and it was a great piece of software, highly configurable. It was difficult to understand how it worked, and there were generations before that as you go from operating systems or compilers. Um, and I think what, um, to Ralph's point, what it gave people was permission to actually describe the design, the architecture of software systems, which... Um, wasn't really done before because of the commercial nature of it, um, and hence it was closed. And from that, build a body of knowledge about how to design software in the small, if you like, which is what design patterns are really about, but also at the much more macro level to some of the points that Ralph was saying earlier on about actually describing the architecture of some of the software systems that we use, um, all of us day to day, to actually understand and take that lessons and learning to take elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, patterns are not only about see, see before research was looking forward what's the next thing right and um, patterns more look backward right what what worked and open source gives you such a wealth of material to look at to learn from right and I think that really opened this door and the anecdote I have now Richard was a researcher at that point and when we had this this iced tea drinking party right in the evening when we separated I said well, let's write a paper and submit to conference I know Richard you were very skeptical wearing your research hat whether it does even make sense right 
You might right. not remember, yeah. but you were yeah, I I was disappointed. I was a little bit disappointed, right? So, well, we have done something cool, but you had the research hard on, and I think this has changed and weakened that up a little bit. That was really good. Um, maybe, maybe ask a more uh, confrontative uh, question. Do you think patterns have uh, made software better these days? So well, they, have, they haven't made it better as much as we had hoped, but they certainly haven't made it worse to the extent that people use them. Again, I know cases where patterns made things worse. You can certainly look at one of the things that happens is people read the book and they get excited about these patterns and they seem to think they're magic, that the more they use the patterns, the better their software is going to be. Instead of figuring out where they should be used and, and the right way of using them and how to adapt them. So I've seen some systems that were really over-designed and a lot more complicated than they needed to be because of misusing patterns. But that's usually just a stage. It's a young person who is still learning, and it's a stage they're going through, um, which they'll either, they'll either drop that stage or they'll mature. Uh, they usually mature. And overall, though, it provides a vocabulary for people to talk to each other about their designs and People, not too many people anymore who, who blindly follow what design patterns say. They use the vocabulary and they use the issues that are talked about. So I think that Ralph makes an important point. You know, um, patterns are not a matter of, of goodness, right? So more patterns doesn't mean more good. I must say for my own experience, right, has have pattern helped me now when I use them myself? So I had the opportunity, you know, when I jumped ship from Java to .NET platform to learn C Sharp, then to learn all the HTML. And I must say, it really helped me because I looked at the other system with the understanding of patterns and it helped me to understand them much faster. And also, it's also kind of, I found it helps un, helped me understanding software much better than without having had this kind of framework of patterns with me. Mm. Um, in .NET, some argue there are already like patterns in the language. Do you think um, it is good that parents become part of the language. When it makes you more productive, more expressive, what can you say against that, right? So imagine, you know, at some point we discussed, is abstract class a pattern, right? I was really happy to see that actually the language is supported direct notion of abstract class like uh, C++ and, and all the other languages that came after, right? So it's a good thing. So you don't have to work at the low level how to emulate the pattern. You can just express it directly. Yeah, we actually talked about that for the book. Should we put abstract class right, in? I remember, yeah. pattern? The reason why we didn't was because almost every other pattern built on top of, of abstract class. And if we had decided that abstract class was a pattern, then we would have had to talk about, well, this pattern includes that pattern. And we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to like make an algebra of patterns. We didn't want to you know, get too complicated. We just wanted to talk about the patterns themselves. So the reason that we didn't include abstract class as a pattern in design patterns was because pretty much every other pattern used it. And, and that, but we all agreed that, yeah, this is a kind of a pattern because the languages don't support it directly, but they probably should. And, well, and, Smalltalk uh, at that time didn't, right? Yet all right, well, not implemented or abstract method, right? Right, but C plus plus didn't either. Uh, I think pure no. virtuals, right? No, that's you could. Well, let's let's not go into this discussion no, no. because it's, even, <laughs> I have to C plus plus, right? Is is far away. So I have to be careful what I say here. <laughs> the point is that in Java and C sharp, it's very clearly supported. You know, it's not yeah. it's not a pattern. It's directly supported by the language, and it, people keep. You know what the, the Lisp people will argue and say that oh all your patterns are directly supported in common. Right, yeah. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration. It's true that many of them are, uh, but not all of them. And even but the point is when when you decide that these patterns are important, then the next thing is how can our languages support them better? And should we change our languages so that we can support them better? And maybe we just include them in the language in some way. That's it's quite reasonable to do that. But on the other hand, what the, what happened is, you know, there's a sense in which patterns are the things that you aren't going to, you need to learn them and you're not going to have them directly in the language but they're going to be built on top of your language. There's always going to be something that's going to be built on the language. Even if the particular patterns in our book end up being brought into languages, people will just then have patterns on top of them. So the need for patterns is not going to go away. And I think they really help people learn object-oriented thinking, you know, how to leverage polymorphism, balance, distributed responsibilities, delegation, composition. I think there I think we made a contribution to education, people think, to leverage objects in this way. Mm. Um, 
when you look at the the new languages coming up, JavaScript, not necessarily new, but uh, be becoming more and more popular, a, a very functional language, also languages like F Sharp and, and uh, Scala. Um, do you think there are new patterns uh, which should be uh, discovered um, for functional languages? Oh, absolutely. And JavaScript, you know, when I learned kind of JavaScript, when I got deep in HTML program, you no, know, it's you look at jQuery and you find beautiful patterns like the fluent interfaces, how they chain methods, how they deal with uh, managing callbacks, right? Deferred or promises, all the things. So I think, yeah, I can never stop of thinking of harvesting patterns for all this code that, from, from elegant code. And JavaScript is a good source. Uh, you know, the libraries, it's very rich libraries, Angular shows us dependence injection, right? Once you understand dependence injection as a pattern, you go to Angular and you know, oh yeah, sure, dependence injection, that's what it is, right? So absolutely. JavaScript is a rich source of patterns. And, and I, I heard patterns. another podcast who was who was telling that JavaScript is uh, has to be put into the straight jacket of patterns to be usable. I see one problem with JavaScript is you need to have what what we talked a little bit about before. For JavaScript to make it really use, you have to use some patterns to even get to modules, right? How do I do module which encapsulates and manages the scope of things, right? So you have for for if you use JavaScript as is. You actually need to invent some patterns for how to do modules, how to do classes, right? And how to do inheritance because JavaScript gives you kind of the, the infrastructure for do that. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about another language relating this one, which I'm also using a lot these days, TypeScript. And TypeScript does exactly what we talked before. It codifies the patterns you have to use for JavaScript into a language. It defines you, gives you modules, it gives you interfaces and gives you uh, how to do classes, right? So... That's to me, it's a nice evolution, right? JavaScript, you need to use Splat to make it usable. And TypeScript is an example that then codifies these patterns into a language and supports it directly. So that's why I find it more pleasant to, to program in TypeScript because I don't have to use these conventions for getting to modules anymore. Mm -hmm. TypeScript is many other interesting things like structural typing and so on, but that's another topic. Yeah. Maybe uh, now coming back, you have, you've mentioned it a couple of times the evolution of the observer pattern can somebody describe me um the evolution uh, so what what was the observer pattern in the beginning and how did it evolve over swing and angular and, and uh, what not over the years so uh, observer started as a as a way to express dependencies among coarse kind object right model view control is the most most popular one the model changes you notify the view and it refreshes and so on. And uh, it was kind of pretty coarse trained, right? Then I think Java libraries, they added the listener mechanism where they make it, made it more type safe, right? You describe uh, listener mm -hmm. interfaces, you get the events that came in, they are all typed, they added the typing notion to make it more flexible. So you had listeners, then you had the whole new UI toolkits that are based on data binding, right? Where you bind widgets together that you actually, it's more declarative. You don't have to deal with sending this notification itself, that's kind of the level below, right? That's that was the next step I see. In so observer. the data binding is kind of, the, the observer is done by the framework? On the NISU, right? You just declare it to say, yeah, bind me this widget to this uh, view model or whatever, right? And then when it changes, they will on the knees use notifications to keep this uh, in sync. So what comes to mind? Then I guess the last evolution is how this reactive programming that is about how you can make it even easier Right to use observer, that the events become more first class. Right, so even a whole discussion is the deprecate observer in favor of this reactive programming style. Yeah. In a very detailed uh, way, when in the original um, observer there was a single update operation, and if you if an observer was going to observe a particular subject, it would it'd say it's, uh, register itself as dependent. But that subject might change in a variety of different ways. You'd be given an update operation for each one. You would then end up in your, your uh, update. You would have to uh, figure out what kind of change was it. Uh, and so it would be a case statement often, trying to figure out what had really happened. And not only that, but you could uh, be uh, interested in observing several different objects. And then all of them would be calling the exact same update operation on you. And so figuring out which one of these objects had actually notified, it, it was all possible. It was just sort of complicated. But what happened in the observer pattern is there's now lots of different uh, notification interfaces. Every, with a listener, every listener defines a different interface. And with, even within a single listener interface, you can have a number of different kind of events that can occur. And so 
by splitting those interfaces up into smaller, more granular, as you say, more granular, then you get uh, you get better. Um, you, you don't have to have all of the case statements over on the side of the code you're you're writing, so you don't have to, I guess, reverse engineer the, the detail. Now, the interesting thing is that both Smalltalk and C++ were using the similar type of observer um, design, and Java. I always think of Java as being you know, halfway in between Smalltalk and C++. And so you say, well, if it was good for Smalltalk and it was good for C++, why didn't the Java folks stick with that? Well, in fact, the very first version of Java came out with the observer pattern pretty much in the, in the original way, but then they discovered that was a problem and, and they developed the whole listener uh, variant um, instead of that. Uh, and I think one of the things is that Smalltalk, because it was statically – it was dynamically typed, um, it was easier to reuse this single mechanism. In the C++ world, people didn't actually try to have a single implementation of Observer that you would use everywhere. Every library would sort of do its own. And partly, I think it was that, that Java was both statically typed and they really were trying to make it be very reusable. And so the, the older way was just too rigid. But but it, it's it, that was the sort of thing that, that when we wrote the book, we were pleased with what we did. We weren't saying, well, there's something wrong here and they're bound to improve this in the future. And it was, I, I think, not completely to be expected that it would evolve as much as it did. Did this happen with uh, other patterns in particular? Well, see, there are kind of language mechanism came in that we didn't have at that time, right? Lots of things have changed since we wrote design patterns, right? We had C++, like Java didn't exist then. So interfaces got added, right? So interfaces give you also a way to express things better that we couldn't when we wrote it and wrote our examples. Yeah, a, lot, so. a lot of the patterns, interfaces, like like the, the composite pattern, if interfaces fit into the composite pattern very easily, <clears throat> it doesn't mess it. I would say the creational patterns, we've been making comments about Singleton, but in fact, the, all the creational patterns are not used as much as they were back when we wrote the book because, because of dependency injection as sort of an alternative pattern that it um, couples, yeah, yeah, your couples system. Yeah. So it's sort of a better way of doing things. Yeah. And there's still cases where the other patterns make sense, but they just make sense a lot less frequently because because dependency injection is, is often a, a better way of doing things. So you you mentioned it in the beginning. So I'm just just saying the word of the pattern, singleton. So we added it. This was an example. Everybody understood, right? In C plus plus, how you do singleton, have a static member, and whatever, right? So everybody got that immediately. I think there was a great way to tell somebody what you talk about. But if you think about, it doesn't have a lot of coolness, singleton, right? You add something global, which is kind of against objects, which are more about distributing things and not having this centralized thing, which will at some point hurt you because you want to have multiple of these things or whatever, right? It's often a design shortcut. To me, it's, this single is often a design shortcut. You have a well-known place to get to another object rather than reaching to other objects to get to this space. So that's why it often hurts over time. So that's why it's not on my top, fa of my favorite list of patterns, right? So I, to me, it's one of the things which should be voted off the island singleton. In, in small talk, uh, singleton has not been the problem that it is in C++. And what people have used it for in, in, in small talk is... Uh, you, you try to eliminate global state, and when you can't, when you just can't get rid of it, the, then then you manage it, and it's a good way of managing it. But the problem is, I think in C++, is that a lot of people, instead of using it as a way to manage global state you can't get rid of, they instead use it as an excuse or something that would make it okay to have global state. That's well, but it's almost so, a justification that's right, for it's having global state. It's a justification for having global state. See, it's a pattern, so it's okay because it's a pattern. And, and global state's bad. You want to get rid of it as much as you can. And, and my rule is it's very easy to add global state, but it's very hard to take it out. Yeah. So do you think in retrospective you should, shouldn't have put it into the book? I, I See, I love all the patterns that we have in the book, right? So that's why I made peace with them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think. To, I think so so, so I've, I've got a version of, of Singleton that I've rewritten, and yeah. I wrote it in a way to make it really clear that global state is bad, and this is only what you do when you can't get rid of it. So we could have written it in a way that would have made that more clear. It's just we didn't realize how people were going to interpret it. We didn't realize that people were going to take it as a justification for global state. And yeah, how do you check that out? Uh, Except you put the book out there and see what people do with it. Yeah. I don't know. 
Yeah, and I think that I mean that the book was a a collective view of many people um, about what was kind of practice at, at that point in time. But the industry evolves, and we've discussed people look and discover better ways or design or work out better ways to solve design problems and the languages evolve. And um, I think the, like Eric, there's a lot in the patterns and, and I recall fondly many arguments, discussions, explaining them to people, but they were, they are a view of the world at a point in time and um, the world industry, software engineering, the languages, the types of problems that people are solving have, have changed. And it's a natural evolution that the, the relative importance, applicability, usefulness of our small set of patterns versus others which have, or design techniques which people have um, come across in more recent times um, are perhaps better choices. And so, and some of the ones that we've wrote, as Ralph was saying, uh, need to be tuned up, um, re-evaluated in terms of current um, practice. Are there something you would think in particular about? Well, you mentioned using language mechanisms, right? We mentioned um, using modern, more modern languages, how, how to represent that. Patterns we didn't include, like dependence injection, because they came later, right? So I think the book still teaches you object unit thinking, but there are many things you, we could do to modernize it or make it, yeah, modernize it probably. So will you will you modernize it uh, or is that something you want to pass on to the new generation? And do you have someone in mind to do that? Well, we've been talking about doing it for a long time. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to be doing it. I, so I, yeah, I, I think that it's a very difficult question because I think it's um, the – it, it was a product at a point in time and a group of people. Um, I think the combination of the four of us, um, Eric, Ralph, John, and I, um, at that point in time was a unique a unique point in time. And um, uh, it will be a challenge, I think, to... Um, uh, Richard, Richard, every point in time is a unique point in time. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think it's a challenge to... Um, Will always be a challenge to do it. It requires it requires a lot of work. It requires a significant amount of thinking and input from lots of people. And um, uh, we've talked about it over many years. And we were talking about it, and when unfortunately John passed away, and um, that was uh, um, uh, a great loss for us. And so the the magic that I think we had there is sort of gone forever. So we'll see. We had discussed an outline with John, right? This was when we all met John. Showed before Correct. he died, right? We met him yeah. there and. We talked about the outline. Yeah, that was 2005. Yeah. Okay. Um, this uh, gives you the, the final chance to uh, answer to a question I should have asked, um, which I forgot to ask. Well, one might be what other patterns work uh, do we like? One of my favorite patterns books is the one by uh, Eric Evans. It's Domain Driven Design. And uh, it's not, the name doesn't say patterns, you know, so you don't, people don't necessarily say, I'm looking for a patterns book, so I'm going to go buy domain driven design. But uh, well, Eric, uh, he structured his book around patterns. That was a way he was thinking. It helped him to, uh, to control, to, to figure out what he was going to say and, and figure out what needed to be said. He came to patterns uh, conferences and, and had a lot of feedback. You know, so he public went through you know, so chapter by chapter, not all the chapters, but many of his chapters. Uh, he, he took them to patterns conferences. To uh, and Anyway, it's, it's, so in some sense, it's a product of the patterns community, a really great book. Uh, the topic of the book is, uh, I think, object-oriented programming often gets thought of too much from a, a purely uh, technique and, and programming point of view. But it should also, originally, we, we always talked about object-oriented designs as being a model of the problem as well. And, and so he focuses much more, as the name says, on, on the, domain, the problem domain and how do you make your system be a, a domain model as well as being an executing program. Mm -hmm. But ties into refactoring lots of other uh, more modern ideas. It's one of my favorite books. 
I think what's important to me about when it comes to design patterns, there is much more, it's much richer, the community, than just what we have in our book, right? So, and I think we were lucky to be kind of the first one, but now you want to really get the full richness, there is much more than just, we are a small contribution to the whole richness of the pattern community today. But I really do wish the functional programming people would get their act together and write uh, books on the patterns of functional programming, because you made this comment about that. There's, there's so many patterns in in that style, uh, but it doesn't, it's hard for people to learn it. Um, I hope some people will hear that. Um, I would like to close by asking you, um, so what are you working on now uh, and where can people find out more about you? Upcoming books, videos, blogs, upcoming talks somewhere? Uh, maybe we, we we start again with Erich. Well, I, I, I still work on tools, right? And... Um... I love them and I love to build them. I love to use them. So see, see stuff from me in the tool space. Right. That's what I would say here. Okay. Um, are you on Twitter or do you write a blog? I'm on Twitter. I, we have a team blog, right? So because I'm not that, that I don't yeah. frequent poses. We have a team blog on the stuff we do. Right. So it's, uh, the project right now we work on this kind of what we have recently lived. This is visual studio. What is it called? Visual Studio Online Monaco, right? Mm -hmm. And if you Google for that, then you find uh, some of my recent work mm -hmm. and also talks about large scale JavaScript. All right. I will, I will link stuff. to that uh, in the show notes. Yeah. Um, Richard, where can people find out more about you? Um, and most of my work is actually um, proprietary and quite confidential. Just the nature <laughs> of the, um, the company, Boston Consulting Group, will basically do who I work for. Um, we don't really talk about what we do, but the work that I tend to spend my, most of my time doing nowadays is working with um, some of the larger companies in Australia and around the world. And um, the last few years, I've been spending um, a fair amount of time in applying technology to um, banking, which most people will experience day to day, but also in the mining industry about how to use technology to um, automate and operate mines in Australia quite differently. So think of NASA emission control as a way to operate large mines or those large yellow mining trucks. How do we make those run in the mine without people? And more recently, I've been doing some work in the um, social services space. Actually, how do I think about the, the payment of benefits for a country and thinking different ways to tackle that problem using technology around payment, digital um, devices? So I don't do much work in the software engineering world anymore. I spend most of my time working in um, large corporates, helping them use technology to solve some of the big challenging industry or corporate problems they face. Um, um, so you might experience in different parts of the world some of what I do, but unfortunately I can't really talk about it. But you still love patterns, Richard, right? I do still love patterns. And in fact, one of the one of the things which I think is so we worry a lot in our company about um, corporate strategy. How how do companies succeed or fail, and why do they succeed or fail? And there is some interesting work on um, which you can access it on our Boston Consulting Group's um, Perspectives website on what we call value patterns, which for different types of industries and different types of competitive situations where the industry is either very static industry doesn't change, or there's a lot of dynamism in the industry. Um, so the difference between operating a an energy company utility versus a retailer. And what we observe there is that there are different patterns of strategy, which um, what we call value patterns, which how those large corporations can um, kind of win in their markets. And it looks a lot like design patterns, different ways for the companies to tackle issues of strategy, how they play in their markets, um, how they compete to win over the long term. And we've not me, but folks in our um, company have written them down, literally as a thing, set of things called value patterns. And you can read a bit about those on um, BCG's website. All right. I'm locating that and put it in the show notes. Um, and uh, Ralf, uh, where can people find more about you and your work? Well, you started off by saying that I was at the University of Illinois. I actually just retired. Uh, <laughs> and I, have, uh, I retired so that I could be working with a startup uh, called Metaficient, which is uh, very small at the moment. Uh, our goal is to make uh, you know, accounting systems that 
accountants can customize and have complete control over. So we want to build things that are scalable um, and fairly um, yeah, it's a quite quite customizable. We're we're originally working in the investment uh, area, uh, so back office systems for hedge funds and things like that. Uh, but but the idea is that you know often these uh, small groups are run off the of spreadsheets, and I think that the reason why they like to use spreadsheets is because they understand them and they can control them. Instead of buying some software package which might do the right thing or might not do the right thing, but you never know. But the problem with spreadsheets is that they're um, you know, they're not very scalable, and if somebody else comes in and starts changing the spreadsheet, it's hard to know whether they did it right. Uh, it's not uh, very auditable. Uh, it's hard to know what changes people have made to them. And so for, for a real system, you want to have something that uh, where you know who made changes and you keep a complete audit trail of what's happened. And so anyway, we are that's sort of the area that I'm uh, working in. I'm not hard to find. Um, I go to conferences and do things. So, um, are you on Twitter or do you have a blog? Um, I have a Twitter account. I don't use it too much. <laughs> okay. And I have blogged in the past. I sort of planning to start up again more, uh, but um, okay, not not active right at the moment. Um, thank you for, for all of your um, participation. For me, it was a very interesting episode, and I was honored to speak with uh, you three guys. Um, goodbye, uh, Erich. Goodbye, uh, Richard. And goodbye, Ralf. Hey, Hannes. It was fun. And talk to you again in 10 years. <laughs> 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 um, you will find all those things mentioned in the show notes. I will prepare them for you. Um, we would actually like to have feedback for our SE Radio episodes so they get as good as the design pattern book was. So if you could write uh, a comment in the blog or um, write a review in iTunes, we're really looking forward to them. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. Um, that would be very helpful. In this instance, uh, I say goodbye. I'm Johannes from SE Radio. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To support us, you can advertise SE Radio by clicking the Dig, Reddit, Delicious, or Slash Dot buttons on the site, or by talking about us on Facebook, Twitter, or your own blog. If you have feedback specific to an episode, please use the commenting feature on the site so that other listeners can respond to your comments as well. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks again for your support.